You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast. Welcome fellow travelers through the liturgical year. This is Lisa Davis with another feast day quick take on the Feast of St. Alphonsus. Born in Naples in 1696 to an impoverished noble family, Alphonsus Maria de Liguori started life humble in assets but rich in promise and the light of his parents' eyes, the hope of the Liguori family, and understandably so. He was a child prodigy, a master musician by the age of 13, and a university graduate at just 16, receiving his degree as Doctor of Laws by special exception, as 20 was the age generally required by the statutes in Italy. He later wrote that when he walked up to receive his degree, he was so small of stature, his commencement robes engulfed him and all the spectators laughed. But he had the last laugh. Undeterred by whispers implying that he wouldn't be taken seriously in the courts due to his youthful appearance, he hung up his diploma and immediately began his studies for the bar, receiving his license to practice law at the age of only 19. Young Alphonsus de Liguori dangled the world on a string in those days. Noble by birth and raised by distinguished godly parents, he had further earned the respect of all who knew him for his success in his chosen profession. Intelligent and personable by all accounts, including that of his confessor, he led a virtuous, if not particularly, pious life. By the time he'd reached 27 years old, except for his parents' constant pressure on him to find a wife and settle down, Alphonsus was not only content with his lot, but he would say himself that he'd, perhaps understandably, become a trifle puffed up by the expectation of worldly success. Not that he was vain or arrogant, mind you. He simply had had no experience with failure. But God had other plans for his prodigy, plans that required a lightning bolt of humility to pierce through young Alphonsus's worldly fog. The Catholic Encyclopedia, 1913 edition, tells the story like this. In 1723, there was a lawsuit in the courts between a Neapolitan nobleman, whose name has not come down to us, and the Grand Duke of Tuscany, in which property valued at 500,000 ducats, that is to say 500,000 or 100,000 pounds, was at stake. Alphonsus was one of the leading counsel. We do not know on which side. When the day came, the future saint made a brilliant opening speech and sat down confident of victory. But before he called a witness, the opposing counsel said to him in chilling tones, Your arguments are wasted breath. You have overlooked a document which destroys your whole case. What document is that? said Alphonse, somewhat piqued. Let us have it. A piece of evidence was handed to him which he had read and reread many times, but always in a sense the exact contrary of that which he now saw it to have. The poor advocate turned pale. He remained thunderstruck for a moment, then said in a broken voice, You are right. I have been mistaken. This document gives you the case. In vain, those around him and even the judge on the bench tried to console him. He was crushed to the earth. He thought his mistake would be ascribed not to oversight, but to deliberate deceit. He felt as if his career was ruined and left the court almost beside himself, saying, World, I know you now. Courts, you shall never see me more. For three days he refused all food. Then the storm subsided, and he began to see that his humiliation had been sent him by God to break down his pride and wean him from the world. Confident that some special sacrifice was required of him, though he did not yet know what it was, he did not return to his profession, but spent his days in prayer, seeking to know God's will. After a short interval, we do not know exactly how long, the answer came. On the 28th of August, 1723, the young advocate had gone to perform a favorite act of charity by visiting the sick in the hospital for the incurables. Suddenly, he found himself surrounded by a mysterious light. The house seemed to rock, and an interior voice said, Leave the world and give thyself to me. This occurred twice. Alphonsus left the hospital and went to the Church of the Redemption of Captives. Here he laid his sword before the statue of Our Lady and made a solemn resolution to enter the ecclesiastical state and furthermore to offer himself 
as a novice to the fathers of the oratory. End of quote. If you think that God then paved the way for St. Alphonsus, sweeping aside all conflict and difficulty, you haven't listened to very many feast day quick takes. No, indeed, as we know, especially in regard to his religious, God saves heaven for heaven. Difficulty and conflict paved the remainder of St. Alphonsus' life path. And though he may have stumbled on occasion, he never let stumbling blocks deter him from doing God's will. You might say that finding ways over and around stumbling blocks became his life's work. The first stone St. Alphonsus had to hurdle once he realized his vocation was his father. He was indeed ordained in 1726, but only after a clash with his dad, Don Joseph Liguori, who was very put out to see his worldly dreams for his son disintegrating right before his eyes. To appease his family, St. Alphonsus gave up his first choice of joining St. Philip Neri's Fathers of the Oratory by agreeing to be ordained into the secular priesthood, a decision which ultimately proved to segue with God's will for him to found his own order, a stumbling block that became a stepping stone. Little did Alphonsus realize, however, that this step crossed the threshold into a minefield of hurdles, Amidst considerable confusion and discord, St. Alphonsus finally founded the Congregation of the Most Holy Redeemer, commonly known as the Redemptorists, a missionary order, in 1732 at Scala, Italy. But years of dissension within the congregation culminated in 1777 when he was deceived into signing what he thought was a royal sanction for his rule. But the document was actually a new rule devised by one of his enemies— the end result being that the order was split in two, those who followed the new rule and those who followed the old rule, a schism that was not resolved until after St. Alphonsus' death. His redemptorist order provided a full course of painful burdens and obstacles to overcome, and you might think that this was enough for one person to have to handle. But God knew that his Alphonsus had it in him to run a course that most would never attempt, much less win. In 1762, Pope Clement XIII made him Bishop of St. Agatha near Naples. He had been offered the bishopric of Palermo in 1747 and was able to withdraw himself from that honor, but it was a hurdle only temporarily averted. Fifteen years later, our saint was obliged by papal insistence to accept the St. Agatha assignment, which was an obstacle course of struggles. This Neapolitan diocese, well known for its unruly people, its lax and sometimes scandalous clergy, and its indifferent religious houses, became for thirteen years his cross and his challenge. He wept and prayed unceasingly, and worked among the people tirelessly. More than once he faced assassination attempts. Once, during a famine, when a government official of the town had been taken hostage, he saved the man's life by offering himself to the mob. He fed the sick, instructed the ignorant, reformed the convents, abbeys, and seminaries, counseled the wayward, and banished the scandalous, regardless of their station in life. Amazingly, in spite of all these labors, it was during this time of his life, when he was in his fifties, that he began his prolific writing career, finishing 111 works on spirituality and theology, and more than 1,500 letters that we know about, before his death at the age of 91. Early in his religious life, St. Alphonsus had made a vow to never waste a moment's time, and it is easy to see that he lived up to this vow. He never made excuses to rest, even though burdened with a constant stress of illness. Aside from his last illness, St. Alphonsus received extreme unction eight times in his life, the worst being an attack of rheumatic fever that lasted from May of 1768 to June of 1769 and left him with a paralysis that caused the bent head so often portrayed in his portraits. It's hard to imagine the penance of this condition. His chin pressed so unrelentingly against his chest that it caused a painful wound. Thankfully, doctors were eventually able to straighten his neck enough to allay the pressure, but for the rest of his life he had to drink his meals through a straw. He offered mass by supporting himself with a chair placed near the altar, and could only lift the chalice with the aid of an acolyte supporting his arm. 
In spite of all this, though, and undoubtedly due to the urgings of the Holy Ghost, both Pope Clement XIII and Pope Clement XIV refused to allow him to leave his post, and it wasn't until Pope Pius VI ascended the chair of Peter in May of 1775 that St. Alphonsus was permitted to retire. At 79 years of age, then, he prepared for what he expected and hoped to be an imminent departure from the mortal plane, but his suffering and labors were still not over. It was during this phase of his life, in his 80s, mostly deaf and almost blind, that he suffered through the treachery already mentioned that tore his order asunder, alienated him from the Pope, and separated him from the Redemptorists. Stones of sorrow that more than stumbling blocks were weights around his already bent neck. For the last three years of his life, he suffered many temptations, diabolical apparitions, and impulses to despair, but he overcame all, dying in peace and in the odor of sanctity on August 1st, 1787. The confusion of the Redemptorist debacle of his last years evaporated almost magically after his death. He was declared venerable within ten years, was beatified in 1816, and added to the canon of saints in 1839. He was declared a doctor of the church in 1871. His first biographer, a contemporary by the name of Tenoya, described him affectionately, quote, Alphonsus was of middle height. His head was rather large, his hair black and beard well grown. He tells us that he had a pleasant smile and his conversation was very agreeable, yet he had great dignity of manner. He was a born leader of men. His devotion to the Blessed Sacrament and to Our Lady was extraordinary. He had a tender charity toward all who were in trouble. He would go to any length to try to save a vocation. He would expose himself to death to prevent sin. He had a love for the lower animals and wild creatures who fled from all else would come to him as to a friend. Unquote. Entered into the cause of St. Alphonsus' canonization were incidents wherein his intercession healed the sick. He was able to read the secrets of hearts and foretold the future. On three different occasions while preaching, a ray of light from a picture of the Blessed Mother shone upon him, and he fell into an ecstasy before the people. More than once in his old age he was seen to levitate when speaking of God. And it is recorded that he fell into a trance at Arienzo on the 21st of September, 1774, and was present in spirit at the deathbed in Rome of Pope Clement XIV. In spite of all the burdens he carried and the obstacles he worked around, climbed over, and crawled under, he reached the finish line victorious, and his influence lives on. A poet and composer, St. Alphonsus wrote the familiar hymn, O God of Loveliness, along with countless other hymns, verses, and prayers. And most of us are familiar with his well-loved way of the cross. He wrote manuals for seminarians, confessors, and bishops, and spiritual guides for religious sisters. He wrote meditations in honor of St. Joseph and preparations for death. He wrote extensively about the Mother of God and the Blessed Sacrament. He even wrote a pamphlet called The Method of Making Mental Prayer with Children During Mass, which I would love to get my hands on. And this is just a small sampling. To date, St. Alphonsus' writings have accrued over 21,500 editions and have been translated into 72 languages. His works on moral theology and on devotion to the Blessed Mother, notably the glories of Mary, are considered classic treasures of Catholic literature. He who felt abandoned by his own in the last years of his life is beloved by Catholics worldwide 335 years after his death. A Renaissance man in every good sense of the description, St. Alphonsus left a legacy of music, poetry, and wisdom as edifying and pertinent today as it was in the 17th century. Real beauty and truth have no time stamp. In point of fact, I'd like to close with a quote I think we can perhaps appreciate even more in our time than those who first read it in the 18th century, because we can now clearly see the proof of his conclusion. St. Alphonsus de Liguori wrote, To reject the divine teaching of the Catholic Church is to reject the very basis of reason and revelation. 
for neither the principles of the one nor those of the other have any longer any solid support to rest on. They can then be interpreted by everyone as he pleases. Everyone can deny all truths whatsoever he chooses to deny. I therefore repeat, if the divine teaching authority of the Church and the obedience to it are rejected, every error will be endorsed and must be tolerated. St. Alphonsus de Liguori, pray for us. <laughs>